Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today I'm here to do the next recent reads video where I wrap up the last five books that I've read. So today I'm here to wrap up books number six through ten. If you are interested in seeing the first five books that I read in 2023, I will be sure to link that video down below for you. So book number six that I read in 2023 was The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentile. And this book is actually quite complicatedly told and I'm going to see if I'm able to explain it in a way that's understandable. So in this story you are following Freddie. She is a writer and at the beginning of the story she's in the reading room of the Boston Public Library. She is trying to work on her novel and she is kind of taking inspiration from the people that sit around her. And suddenly a very shrill scream rings out shattering the silence of the library. Nobody knows who screamed, what the cause of the scream was or anything like that, but suddenly Freddie starts to kind of bond with the three people nearest to her, the people that she was kind of taking inspiration from. And soon all four of them kind of leave the library. They eventually find out that somebody has been murdered, the person who screamed has been murdered, and they kind of build friendship around trying to figure out what happened and their shared experiences. And meanwhile Freddie starts starts to base her novel about their experiences. The catch here is that Freddie and those other three are actually characters themselves in this novel that is being written by an author. You don't ever hear from this author. You don't know who she is really. You don't get her own perspective. The entire story is told based through chapters that this author is writing and sending to her friend Leo for feedback and changes and things of that nature. So there's definitely a book within a book within a book kind of going on here. And I will say that if you go into this book expecting it to be a lot room mystery because that's kind of how it is advertised. You are going to be very disappointed because that is not what this is. These four are not stuck in the library investigating the murder. No, they don't even find out there was a murder until after they have all left the library and they start building relationships after that. Overall, I had a very strong and positive reading experience with this book. Was it very uniquely told? Yes, and I can understand why the writing style wouldn't necessarily work for everybody, but it worked for me. You know, you're following Freddie and these other three as they are building friendships, as they are kind of finding out what happened to the person that was murdered as they are uncovering all kinds of secret connections and what could have possibly led to this murder. And then after every single chapter, you will be getting Leo's feedback on that chapter. And in some ways I found it a little bit interesting because there's a self-awareness there because Leo is providing feedback that we as readers might have ourselves, but it was very jarring and abrupt continuously having Leo's perspective in here. It is not necessarily one that I understood. I cannot say the point that Sulari Gentile was trying to make with this perspective. I don't necessarily know what it added to the overall story. Like why wasn't this just straight up a story about Freddie, the people that she meets in the library, and the relationship afterwards as she is trying to like work on the novel herself. So I think that there is something that went over my head about the story and that is definitely true with how this ended because the ending scene I'm still quite confused on. I don't get the message of that last scene. If somebody has read this and you understand more about what it was trying to say, please feel free to let me know because I think that just like went way over my head. It started to get more and more jarring as we go on because Leo starts to get more and more aggressive about his feedback and oddly enough about the pandemic. He doesn't understand why this author is not including the pandemic in that story with Freddy and the murder and things like that. And he was really passionate about it. He was really passionate about why the pandemic needed to be in the story. And so I'm wondering if Sulari Gentile just included that in Leo's feedback because she kind of felt herself like it needed to be mentioned in some way since she was writing it during the pandemic. And I can understand why this book is so lowly rated. Like on Goodreads, I think it only has like a 3.52, 3.53 rating. And so I was very trepidatious going into it and I can understand how that feedback aspect of it would really affect somebody's reading experience. Luckily I was entertained enough by those sections where I could just overlook it and then my reading experience with everything else was really positive. Like I was really invested in Freddie. It was told from her perspective those chapters and the connections that were being made and the little twists and turns that Sulari Gentile threw into the story because I definitely wanted more by the time it ended. Was the whodunit necessarily shocking? No, but as I always say it's not necessarily about the whodunit. It's about the journey and how we get there and I found that immensely entertaining. So like I said, I gave this four stars and I think if it's on your TBR, if anything that I've said sounds interesting to you, definitely give it a shot and form your own opinion on it because it could be for you like it was for me. So that was book number six. Book number seven was The Final Revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton. So this book is constantly compared to Daisy Jones and the Six because it is set in the 70s. It's following musicians in the 70s. So you have the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing. And 
and it is also told in that oral history interview style format. The audiobook does have a full cast, which was amazing. But aside from that, I would feel like that is where the similarities with Daisy and Jones and the Six ends. And unfortunately, I'm kind of disappointed about that because this just didn't work for me in the same way that Daisy Jones and the Six did. Because where Daisy Jones and the Six was almost entirely focused on the music and the complex character relationships between everybody in the story, this was almost entirely more focused on racial politics. And while I understand why that's important, especially within the context of the 70s, which was a very tumultuous time, especially in America, that's not what I was looking for going in. And because of that, this story didn't necessarily feel as fully realized for me. The characters definitely didn't feel fully realized to me, and neither did the music, because there was almost very little musical focus in this story, unlike with Daisy Jones and the Six, where I felt like they were so real and their music was so real. When I stopped reading that story, I felt like I could go and listen to their albums. That's how fully realized it was. But that wasn't the case in here. And aside from that, this was almost entirely the Opal show. It had very little to do with Nev overall. And in the end, they kind of made Nev villain of the story, which I'm not entirely sure I understand. Let me backtrack a little bit and tell you what this is actually about. So at the start of the story in the 70s, Opal is a young black woman. She is living in either Chicago or Detroit. I can't remember which, but she is basically discovered by Nev Charles, who is a white British ginger singer. And he is looking for a partner to form a duo that he can create music with. And so they are signed with this very small record label. And in an effort to kind of promote Opal and Nev, as well as some of their bigger and smaller acts, they are going to be putting on a showcase. And this story is kind of centered around that showcase because something very tragic happens at the showcase and one of the band members ends up dead. The drummer of the band ends up dead. And that actually brings me to who is actually telling Opal and Nev's story. So like I said, this is told in the oral history interview type format. And the person that is doing the interviews is S. Sunny Shelton. She's a journalist and she is an editor for a magazine called Oral and she has been given the rights to tell Opal and Nev's story. They're basically going to be reuniting for a reunion tour and in order to get some publicity for this tour, they're going to finally be telling their story, especially what happened at the showcase that night. And S. Sunny Shelton has been given the rights to the story because she has a personal connection to it in that the drummer was her father. And so on the outset, this has the potential to be a really fascinating story. And like I said, I love the way that it was told in the interview style format, especially with the full cast, but the character characters in here just were not fully realized, especially because it was very much the Opal show. Nev, I felt, had very little to do with the story overall. It was very much about Opal's upbringing and her journey to get to where she was, and then the tragedy of that showcase, especially since Opal had a personal connection with the drummer and what happened after the showcase and how they kind of went their separate ways. And on top of that, you are actually getting Sunny's perspective in here. So in between the interviews that she's doing, you are getting her own personal perspective as she kind of laments on her own life and the issues that she's having, gaining the stories and all of that, which I didn't necessarily feel like needed to be there. If you are going into this story for the music, you are going to be sadly disappointed because even now I still don't quite understand the music that they sung. There was very little talk about the lyrics or things like that. So that was definitely lagging. The characters were just very flat for me. They were very two dimensional. They didn't feel fully realized. And I definitely think that you got way more of Opal than you got of Nev. And overall, not what I was looking for going into the story. So sadly, this didn't work for me. I only gave this one a three stars. I don't think I'm going to hang on to it. I think I'm going to be selling this in my pango shop. Thank Hopefully the rest of these reads were a lot stronger for me. So book number eight that I finished was Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Jillian McAllister. This was a wild ride. It was a good time and I felt like this was absolutely compulsively bingeable. So at the very beginning of this story, you're following our main character. She's 43 years old. She is up late in her house, kind of waiting for her son Todd, who is about to break curfew. And when she sees her son Todd walking down the street, she is understandably relieved, but that relief quickly turns to terror as she sees her son, her gentle, kind, very intelligent son, brutally stab a man who appeared on the street to death. And this is a man that Jen doesn't know. And so naturally the chaos and the horror ensue from there as he is arrested and taken to the police station and they're trying to figure out what to do. And then in a fit of exhaustion, Jen kind of falls asleep. And when she wakes up, it hasn't happened because she's actually woken up the day before the crime. And she continues to find herself living her life backwards at first by days, then by weeks, then by months, and then by even years. And every single day that she wakes up, something important happens, something that she missed previously that she now needs to pay attention to in order to figure out how to stop this crime and in order to figure out how to get back to 2022. And like I said, this was just a fun, compulsively readable ride. Now, obviously there is a bit of a genre blend here because this does deal with time travel and the fact that she is moving through her life backwards. But if you're going into this thinking you're going to get Blake Crouch level sci-fi, you're gonna be very, very disappointed. It is definitely not 
on that level. It's not intricately told science that's going to go over your head. No, you really as the reader just have to understand that there was a phenomenon great enough to thrust our main character through time. And you are trying to figure out what's going on along with Jen. Obviously she's very, very confused. She doesn't understand what is happening. She's trying to explain to people in her life what is happening. She's trying to prove to them that she is traveling through time. And of course nobody believes her and then she's going backwards. So her days are going the opposite direction of everybody else's. So even if she does explain and get somebody to believe her one day, it's not going to be the same the next day. So it is a very exhausting situation for her. And of course you as the reader are also trying to figure things out along with her as she's uncovering these little clues that she didn't notice before. And she's trying to piece together the puzzle and she's finding out who the man is that was killed, why Todd could have potentially wanted him dead and a lot of other secrets that are revealed going in. And I really enjoyed the fact that Jillian McAllister kind of sprinkled the big reveals throughout the story, kind of helping propel the plot forward. I felt the pacing of this was phenomenal. I've seen some reviews saying that this was very slow for them and it dragged. I really don't see how that's possible. This wasn't a very long story overall. I felt like it flowed continuously from one thing to the next. Could the time travel have been shortened a little bit? Possibly because there were some days that were more eventful than the others, but every single day you're learning a little bit of something. You're uncovering another piece to the puzzle. And I just enjoyed the way that Jillian McAllister put together this story. And normally I don't really like fast paced stories. They don't always work for me just because I am such a character driven reader. And I want to be able to have the emotional connection, which you don't typically get with fast paced stories. But something about this story just really worked for me. I was completely immersed in it. I wanted Jen to figure out what happened to her family. And ultimately it just ended up being quite a treat. So this was a very solid, enjoyable reading experience for me. And I gave this one an easy and a strong four stars. So this next book I'm reading as part of a vlog that I'm doing that's going to be coming out at some point in February. I don't know when. I'm going to tell you a little bit of what this book is about plot wise, but I don't really want to tell you my thoughts on it because I'm going to reserve that for the vlog. And that is Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez. So this book is told from two perspectives. One of them is Alexis. She's a 37 year old emergency room doctor. And one night she is driving home from a funeral. She is in a very rural part of Minnesota. And in order to avoid hitting a raccoon, she drives her car into a ditch. She's all alone in the middle of nowhere kind of stuck. She's talking to her best friend on the phone and then all of a sudden somebody pulls up behind her and offers to tow her out. She gets towed out. She moves along but she knows that she needs to stop for food and the restroom soon and she's not really near a larger city so she stops within that same town at a local watering hole and who is also there but our second main character Daniel Grant. Now Daniel is younger. I believe he is 28 years old and he was born and raised in this small town in Minnesota. He knows everybody there. Everybody knows him. He's actually kind of like the honorable mayor but he also runs a bed and breakfast and he does carpentry work on the side. He's very much a salt of the earth, blue collar type of person. He is just this lumber sexual cinnamon roll. And he was phenomenal because I think like he was like the perfect man, no joke. And so he ends up chatting with Alexis. They go to his place just for further conversation and food. And even though it's kind of against both of their natures, they end up in bed together and Alexis kind of freaks out and runs away and she is not in his bed the next morning, but they reconnect and it goes from there. This is actually much more complicated than you would expect just because of Alexis's situation. She comes from a very very different world than Daniel. She comes from a very long line of renowned and prestigious surgeons and her family has a very long history at this one particular hospital where they've basically been there since the doors opened and it's up to Alexis to continue that legacy. She's meant to be the Montgomery in residence now that her parents have retired. She's feeling a lot of pressure from her family to uphold this legacy and her father is a very hard man. He's a very difficult man to please. He thinks that Alexis is not living up to her full potential and there is no way in this world that he would approve of a man like Daniel for Alexis. And on top of that, Alexis is now getting out of a very unhealthy, toxic seven year relationship with an older man that was the chief of surgery at the same hospital. So she has to go to this hospital and she has to see him every single day. And her father, even knowing what he knows about the relationship, still wants Alexis to be with this guy because this guy has a solid reputation. He's got a lot of esteem. So basically Alexis is in a very complicated situation. She lives in a world of privilege and prestige. And obviously she has people in her past that are very uppity. They have very high standards and she just knows that they would look down on Daniel. But even so, Alexis continues to go to the small town called Walk-On in Minnesota to see Daniel and the relationship kind of goes from there, but she tries to keep it as casual as possible because she just knows what her situation is. She knows that Daniel is never going to fit into her world and it just breaks her heart. And then obviously things get a little bit more serious than she intended and she has to deal with those consequences. So I'm not gonna go in detail about my thoughts and feelings of this book. All I'm gonna say is y'all need to read this book, trust me. And 
book number 10 that I read, Surviving Savannah by Patty Callahan. So this is a historical fiction. It is set in two timelines. You have the present day and then you have the past timeline of 1838. So in the present day, you have history professor Everly Winthrop and she is being asked by a longtime friend of hers to help curate an exhibit for a local museum regarding the steamship Pulaski, which is considered to be the Titanic of the South. And they have actually just discovered the wreckage of the Pulaski. And so they are starting to do dives to recover everything that they can about the ship. And Oliver, the friend, is asking Everly to go and curate this exhibit. But Everly is kind of hesitant because she doesn't know if she wants to work closely with Oliver because she and Oliver both share a tragedy. She, Oliver, and a girl named Mora were all best friends for a long time and throughout college. And Oliver eventually started a relationship with Mora and then Mora was tragically killed. And this is such a consuming grief that Everly has not really ever been able to get past. She's kind of living through life in a fog. She can't get past it. She misses Mora. She's pushing Oliver away because there also might be some feelings there for Oliver that she knows she shouldn't be feeling. And so when he approaches her, that's really what she's thinking. She doesn't think that she should be working with Oliver. But at the same time, she and her family have a connection with the Pulaski ship. She grew up hearing stories about the Pulaski from her grandfather and she wants to be a part of this. So she agrees. And so in the present day, you are following her as she's investigating the sinking of the Pulaski and as she's trying to find who the people were that were on board, who perished and who might have lived. And information is few and far between. They don't even have a full manifest of who was on board, but she is making it her mission to solve this, especially because one of the passengers, Lily Forsythe, is kind of a myth around Savannah. There's a statue in town of her, but nobody really knows what happened to her after the ship, if she lived or died, but she's kind of the symbol of the Pulaski sinking. And so Everly is determined to find out what happened to Lily and what happened to the other people on board so she could properly curate this museum. And then in the past, you are following Lily's perspective herself. You are also following the perspective of Lily's aunt Augusta, and they are both boarding Pulaski along with their family. Lily is boarding with her husband and her young daughter, as well as her nursemaid. Augusta has no children of her own, but she's boarding with her brother and his wife and his six children. And so, you're, like I said, you're following Lily and you're following Augusta. But basically, they get on the ship, they dock for one night, and then as they are departing again, headed for Baltimore, boiler explodes and the ship starts to sink. And really, this book follows the aftermath of that sinking and what these people have to go through in the days trying to survive until they could get help. And overall, I really enjoyed this story. This is definitely not a subject that I've ever seen covered in another book. I happen to be a huge fan of Titanic history. I have been ever since I watched the movie for the very first time when I was like 10 years old. That got me on an obsession about learning about the actual Titanic. And so when I heard that this book was about the Titanic of the South, that was absolutely a buzzword for me. So I found learning about the shipwreck quite fascinating. But this book naturally actually explores quite a lot about grief. So many lives were lost on the Pulaski, especially from this one big family. And you're following the surviving members and how they survive the surviving. How do you go on when so many of your family have been brutally taken away from you? And then Everly, of course, has her own guilt because she was there when her best friend Maura died. And and she thinks that it's her fault that she died. She thinks that there's something that could have stopped it. So she is obsessed by Mora's death and she just, she can't let it go and she can't move on. And it's very much affecting her life overall and getting lost in the project and learning more about these people. It's kind of very healing for her. And like I said, overall, it was a really strong reading experience and I gave this a four stars. So not bad. All right, everyone. So those were the last five of my recent reads. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I discussed and what your thoughts and feelings were about them. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and I have a video to film and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.